Going from runners-up at Masters Madrid to being the winners of Masters Shanghai to bombing out of groups and Valorant's biggest stages as they succumb to arguably their biggest rivals of the year, Gen G's 2024 season came to a rather heartbreaking end in front of their home crowd. And it's really tough because they've actually had a really good year. So what ended up going wrong for Valorant's Korean juggernauts? So instead of going into the VODs and the streams and all the replays and nitpicking every single little thing that Genji did wrong against Heretics and Sentinels, what I'd really want to do is to just take a step back and look at Genji's fundamentals as a whole. And why is it that it was kind of set up more for a failure case if the players aren't showing up in terms of their form? So what I observe from Valorant or like from esports in general is that there are always two types of teams. One are the teams that rely more on mechanical brilliance and the other one are the teams that rely more on strat base and actually making protocols for every little situation that they have within a match. So in terms of the first one, mechanical brilliance, I'd just call these the aimer teams. So teams like Genji, Leviathan, and EDG are the ones that I would put into this kind of category. Meanwhile, for the other team which relies more on strategies and protocols, I would call these the strat based teams. And the type of teams that I'll put within this category are like Sentinels, Fnatic, and G2. Especially G2, I feel like they're currently the best type of strat based teams because they're really consistent with what they're doing and they are able to hold their ground very well at the moment. Now, the thing about Gen G's playstyle, which is the aimer team playstyle, is that while yes, when this kind of playstyle is on its flow, on its form, it becomes such an insanely dominant playstyle that it kind of really does, doesn't matter what they're going against because whatever it is that the enemy team will do, they'll just delete them because show up, headshot, show up, headshot. When they're on form, when there's like three or four players all doing this at the same time, that becomes very scary to face and quite frankly, it limits so much options when it comes to just completely out aiming them or just out stratting them because again, no matter what you do, you're just gonna die. And a great example of an aiming team that was going full flow was EDG against PRX in their elimination match because my god, well, first you have Kang Kang who is as usual, Kang Kang doing Kang Kang stuff, but then suddenly Simon1 is being as, as consistent as he's always been in this champs run and then Chi Chu all of a sudden also started fragging and then Smoggy decided, you know what? he'll be Kang Kang instead because he was deleting the crap out of PRX in that decider map of Lotus. Now, but the thing about this aimer type of style of team is that once they crash, they will crash far harder than any type of playstyle you'll see out there. Whereas if players don't aim up in like strat based teams, at least like if say like three players are not exactly in form within a strat based team, it won't be all that bad as long as they can still execute their strats and protocols perfectly. Because then they can just counter the enemy team through that method instead and win rounds through close but still win those rounds and you can see this many many times when you have strat based teams like sentinels go up against very very aim based teams say like crew where yes sentinels look like they probably die more but then they'll win out more rounds because their strategy was just really focused on winning rounds instead of getting kills to win rounds and it's even more of a case for these aimer type of teams when they are going against other aimer type of teams because at that point it was it's just gonna be about who can hit that little bit more of a head in their matches and quite frankly this is what happened to genji when they faced off against heretics because heretics is also an aimer type of team and with the amount of pure firepower they had finally they were able to just edge out genji by just doing that little bit more better in terms of their peaks in terms of when they decide to peak and then eventually genji just lost out by the slimmest of margins now the other fundamental side that i would want to talk about other than their playstyle is the mentality here's the thing about eastern teams that i've noticed not only in valorant but also in esports and sports in general is that this Asian mentality makes it really hard and rare for Asian teams to really fight back when they've supposedly been mentally crushed. And again, like I said, it's not a, an issue that's really specific to Genji as an Asian team. We take a look at FPX against Sen. Now, FPX got an 8-4 lead coming into their attack side in Vine against Sentinels. And 
it looked good. But then Sentinels probably realized that a lot of the defense side picks that FVX was able to play off of in the first half was due to Autumn's pick on his chamber. Now, chamber, incredible on defense. In attack, it's a bit more difficult to utilize him the way they wanted to utilize him. So Sentinels knew that and decided, okay, we're just going to buckle down do what we do in our defense side and we should be able to etch them out and they didn't just etch them out they completely decimated fpx in that second half the fpx didn't get a single round and sentinels was able to win 13-8 and then going into lotus where one it is one of if not sentinels's best map at the moment and then two sentinels was just able to come up with more strats come up with more consistency in that map and three fpx just looked like they were out of the match from then on it didn't look like they they knew what they were doing and you can also see this from the final round where they seem like they didn't communicate the fact that sentinels have used the omen ult to take the bomb instead of having tens flank to god knows nowhere so it was pretty obvious from the start that the mental was just completely gone for fvx which just showcases this sort of asian team mentality that we can see so far because the last time I can think of an Asian team making a long and hard-fought comeback in Valorant's own scene is DRX against Furia in Champs 2022. And that's quite a while ago when you're looking for a rather general thing to find in the scope of a competitive scene. Meanwhile, the rest of the big comebacks that we've seen in Valorant of recent times came from all the other regions. Now, like I said before, this is not a case that's limited to only Valorant's esports scenes. This is something you can see in other esports scenes and just sports in general. The big one that I can think of from other esports scenes is Dota 2, where this team called PSG LGD, which is for a while Dota's biggest Chinese team and one of Dota's biggest team, had a period of dominance where they were absolutely destroying other teams and majors and overall tournaments and just shutting them down in the most dominant ways possible. But then when it comes to performing in the internationals, which is Dota's biggest tournament and arguably esports biggest tournament, PSG LGD just seemed to fall short every single time. In 2018, they got upset and come back by OG. And in 2021, they failed to initiate a reverse sweep against Team Spirit. They started the finals 2-0 down, managed to bring it back all the way to 2-2 only to choke it all up in the fifth map. Now, when it comes to sports in general, I'm Indonesian. The biggest example I can give of is my own country and like football or like badminton because once we fall behind on those sort of uh, scenarios, there's rarely a time where our athletes can pull anything out of the bag and manage to secure a comeback from that. The one that I can think of in terms of, I guess, badminton was Jonathan Christie against uh, Victor Axelson, where, to be fair, Axelson got injured in midway through that uh, third set, so Christie was able to capitalize. Still a good comeback, but there was a caveat to it. And you can just see this from all the other sports that Asian teams are doing, where, quite frankly, when once they're out of it, they're out of it. There's no way for them to come back. So, like I said again, this is kind of a mentality that sort of is concerning the entire region of Asia in itself instead of really focused towards Genji as an individual kind of team. Now, it's clear that fundamentals weren't their only issue because, okay, as so much as I want to cut them some slack, Genji made some really questionable strat calls. Going back into a matchup against a rejuvenated Sen with barely any changes to their overall base strats was never really gonna end well for them. Especially considering the fact that Sentinels made the extremely logical and, quite frankly, really obvious choice to go back to the team comps that they're more used to and have found definite success with. So going back to the map pick of Lotus will make it com a completely different match than what they encountered in the first match of the group stages. And then going into Icebox, Sentinels are just complete wildcards in that map. You never really know what to expect from them. But what you know what to expect from Sentinels and Icebox is the fact that they always give a close match. I've rarely seen them get completely stomped out in Icebox, so Genji should have really known that. Plus. You can't help it to make the comparisons of that second matchup to the fifth map of the Grand Finals of Madrid because everything just seemed to have mirrored perfectly. And the thing is, Sentinels were able to win that match with Sassi on Gecko. And this time around, Sentinels decided to put Sassi back on his signature Sova, an agent that he's known for being one of the best in the world at. And Sova is literally one of the two agents that he won champs grand finals with two years ago. So 
Genji should have really known that going into Icebox was picking the hard route. And it doesn't help that Sentinels completely read them and they knew, apparently they knew that they were gonna choose Icebox as the second map. And it's like what FNS said before the match came back. Sentinels had days to prepare and they were looking mighty confident off of that FPX win. We were about to see a completely different Sentinels than the one that got swept by Gen.G in that opening group stage match. And in the end, they did encounter a whole different Sen and Gen.G barely made any adjustments. They still had too much reliance on texture, I feel like honestly that's that's kind of their main issue as a team in general. And while yes, they had those attack rounds both in Lotus and in Icebox where they were just full on aggression and it looked like it was overwhelming Sentinels and they were able to get 4 or 5 rounds back. But that's the thing, they get the 4 or 5 rounds back and then after that Sentinels just completely shut them off. All Sen needed to do was completely shut down one of their side plus and Genji was just down and out again, unable to really do much else. Not only were there miracle makers in Munchkin and Meteor not being able to do much, I call them miracle makers not Texture because Texture is the one that's overall gonna be carrying but Munchkin and Meteor are the ones that normally comes up with the big plays when you least expect them to get out of a rut in a round. So not only was that not happening, they put Texture in very questionable positions or Texture puts himself in very questionable positions we, we don't really know but basically there's just too many times where Texture was just told to do kind of the impossible which I guess yes you kind of expect him to be the one to do the impossible but that's just not really a consistent thing to rely upon. And like the biggest time where this completely destroys them is of course the final round where Texture was pushed all the way up in A and it looked like he was gonna be like the sole holder of that side and the one that's supposed to take like one or two kills before the rest of Genji comes into play. But then Tens uses Null Command and he just had no escape. He like, even if he did get one, highly there's highly doubt he was gonna get anything more and be able to contribute more because he'll just be dead you know so there's all there's also the situational decisions that Genji was just getting completely wrong but of course it goes without saying that the match was not all about Genji's lackluster showing because quite frankly as much as I've picked on their strats and their fundamentals they still weren't playing all that bad but the thing is Sentinels was playing peak Sentinels and that's really what happens when you don't run fucking deadlock comps without any flashes to boot. Honestly, Sen just kind of shot themselves in the foot with that comp for the past, I don't know, couple of months. So finally, they came back to something that's more solid. And in fact, the confidence and the overall luck that they had within these matches, particularly in defense, is similar to what we normally see Gen G pull off. Such as the 4v5 round that they had on round 5 where Zelsus' kill was enough to get a lockdown out of him and that completely turned the tides of the rounds in just a single kill. This is something that you'd normally see Genji do, they'd get a couple of important picks here and there and then that's able to just completely open the round up for them. Couple that with all the protocols and overall synergy that Sentinels have as a, as a team, Genji just had no way back. And even when they took the timeout and then pulled 5 straight attack rounds back, it didn't really matter in the end because Sentinels eventually bolted down their mentality and was able to secure out the last 2 rounds of the half and they got to 7-5. And everything was just mirroring the way that map 5 in Madrid happened. Tens and Zekken were just doing Tekken things, Sassi and Zelsis were stepping up whenever they needed to step up and John Cutie's calls were just as stable as it always is. So in the end, Gen G just got outclassed completely as a team. It was just a complete mirror of what happened because they started on attack, they didn't really do well on attack, they got a 7-5 half, and after that they only managed to win one round in the second half and Sentinels win 13-6. All completely the same, which is again another callback where you kinda wonder maybe or not Genji could have learned a bit more from the previous matches, you know? Because evidently, if things just end up going the same way, then have they really made enough changes? You just really don't know. But at the end of the day, Gen G's drop honestly can happen to any of these type of aimer teams. Because it only takes a few good kills from one of those teams to topple another one of their own kind. So any fluctuation in form is going to provide wild swings to how a game between two aimer teams might result in. Strat-based teams, on the other hand, need to either be fully counter-stratted or have all five of their team members be completely out-aimed for the entirety of the match for them to begin the crumble. And quite frankly, that 
latter half of the options is kinda hard to do in a more consistent state. Which is why in my opinion that strat based teams would normally have a much higher chance of winning since they rely on a more consistent source of playstyle rather than relying on their players overall aim and form, which would definitely fluctuate from match to match, regardless of how consistent you are as a player or as a team. There's a reason why Team Astralis in CSGO were able to become so dominant from 2018 to 2019, not because they were completely out aiming everyone, but because their strategy and understanding how to use the nate meta was just so far ahead of anyone because well, they pretty much pioneered that era of meta. And due to that, they were able to become the first team to win 3 back to back majors in CSGO and also hold the record for the most major wins. In the end, I feel like Genji will just need to go back to the drawing board and settle their nerves for the next season. It's clear that they have quite the roster in their hands and considering the fact that they came into the year with a rookie smoker in Charon who they literally picked up for a trial after getting crapped on by him in a, in a ranked match if I remember correctly, they can really use this experience to dust off the inexperience and finally shape themselves into an even more sharper team even when they've already looked really sharp all year. Because you have to realize, finalists in one masters and then winners of the other? That's better than most teams in this entire year. So like, you know, quite clearly, there's just a little bit of a kink that they need to work on. And then they're probably going to be able to come back much stronger next year. And quite frankly, I'm really looking forward to that because again, like I said, as much as I really kind of don't enjoy seeing that Aimer style of teams, it's still pretty exciting to see the insane things that they're able to pull off in a mechanical level. So I'm looking forward to what they can do next year, honestly. And that's about all I have to say for this video. I hope you guys have been able to take something out of it or at the very least you've enjoyed seeing what I've been able to say for this video. If you enjoyed it, please do leave a like and if you want to leave your thoughts down in the comments down below, feel free to do so. The name's Leafy and until the next video, I'll see you all next time. Sayonara.